This is Patrick from WSOU 89.5, The Loudest Rock, here with Dakota Alvarez from Holofront. How you doing? Doing good. How about you? Doing fine. Doing fine. Happy uh, last day of spring, by the way. Yo, this feels so weird. I feel like the year is going by so quick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last yeah. thing I remember is it was, it was wintertime over here in Michigan. We just got back home, and then life just sped up. <laughs> So your new album, The Price of Dreaming, is out. It was released on May 27th, nine months after you released the first single, Treading Water, in August of last year. How does it feel to finally have this full album out? It feels insane, honestly, because like I remember, I remember the whole process and journey of what it took to get this first album like um, put together through UNFD, because everything from the pandemic on to this point has been like kind of like euphoric. It feels like uh, you, you took uh, a dream that a lot of people have growing up to be like uh, uh, wide stream musicians, being able to tour and live the life that you want. And I feel like uh, throughout that whole period of time leading up to this point, it's, it, was, it was fun being able to put all of that into a record. So that way it's relatable for everybody. It isn't just our journey at the end of the day. It could be a little bit of everyone's. Yeah, I totally hear that. And uh, that kind of goes into... Uh, the, the theme of the album. It's very personal. Uh, tell me a little bit more about why it's called The Price of Dreaming. Yeah, so this album we titled The Price of Dreaming because um, leading up to that point that I was bringing up, uh, it was it was like uh, we, we had just been releasing singles off of the last album that we dropped. And uh, out of the blue, when we were releasing all those singles and dropping the album, uh, self just self-dropped. Uh, we never anticipated the the growth that we would get from it or being able to um, go to these crazy producers and meet all these cool people to make the next record possible. Uh, we ended up going to Atrium in Pennsylvania to record The Price of Dreaming. And it was one of the things that we agreed on was to implement the fact that it takes a lot of sacrifice to make this lifestyle work to make the music work and you have to be willing to sacrifice a lot of things that you wouldn't normally want to sacrifice like uh, birthdays holidays with your family um time that you could be spending doing a lot of other things but you're devoting strictly to your craft your art and the the journey that music takes you uh, and this album in each each degree of every song that we put in there was very uh very ingrained in us from the beginning we wanted to portray that this is a lot for us. And though it is a lot to give up, it's all the worth it. Yeah, I totally hear all that. And, uh, you know, that's the theme of the record. It's called The Price of Dreaming. Uh, what was your vision for the overall sound of this record going into it? I know you said you went to a lot of different producers. You had been kind of releasing these singles for a while, putting all the work in. What was your vision uh, for the beginning? Um, so the vision from the beginning was more so like I wanted to be able to be as raw and authentic as possible. I wanted at the end of the day that uh, for everyone who listened to the new record to know that like regardless of how it sounds, it is still hollow front. It's still it's still very much um, us trying to express ourselves through the stuff that we're doing. And right from the get go, once we started getting the music in, we were with uh, Carson and Grant over at Atrium Audio. And uh, we told them, we we're just like, anything that we can make to get this album uh, dynamic and feel, feel very uh, personal to whoever's listening to it, we'd like to accomplish, uh, whether that be something we got to do with like the ambience of the album, whether that be something we got to do lyrically. Um, but we wanted to, we wanted to like kind of venture through these different ways of uh, being expressive through the music, aside from just giving it giving it to you on a silver platter, like, okay, this song's a sad song. Here you go. Uh, we wanted it to be like uh, immersive. We wanted you to be able to listen to it and feel, feel every, every tight corner of the song, feel every hill and valley that we put in there. Yeah, I totally hear all that. You know, when I listen to the songs on Price of Dreaming, I noticed there was a, a bit more going on in each song as opposed to your last record, Loose Threads. So lots of different guitar sounds, different vocal styles, but like you said, still some of the heaviest stuff you've ever made. What was the songwriting process like on uh, this album versus Loose Threads? Yeah, so the last album, it was, uh, it was a lot of us trying to figure each other out. 
And I felt like that that showed very well in the songs because we all knew that we wanted to play like metalcore. We wanted to play something that was a little heavier than everything else, but still have like a melodic backdrop to it. And that last album was us like all kind of just trying to combine little bits and pieces and learning what our role was in the group. And then this album, uh, we ended up acquiring Lee as, a, as another member. Lee Albrecht, he was a producer on the first like three albums that Hollow Front produced, um, Home Wrecker, Still Life, and Loose Threads. And then leading into The Price of Dreaming, that was the first time that we decided not to go with Lee. And it wasn't a personal decision. It was more like the band is seeing growth. We want to we wanna explore different avenues of what like songwriting production engineering that we could get out of from um other artists and with the the writing process on this album it was a lot of uh a lot of culmination of ideas we would sit in a room and we would basically just play the song in sections uh to figure out what's what's the best decision for this part um whether it be like we we basically went in with all the instrumentals basically set in stone um, but we went in lyrically and, um, with melodies, uh, trying to have no expectation and give us as much creative, uh, reign as possible. So we'd have some of us like Tate and I, Tyler and I would be, uh, writing the lyrics and coming up with melodies and rhythms ourselves, but then Brandon or Lee or Devin would step in and be like, Hey, I'm hearing this in my head. And we all have our own laptops after we're done recording because we'd go with maybe like, I think it was like seven o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon. And then after that, we would have our own laptops out and we would just record our ideas, share them with each other and kind of just decide from there what was the best decision for the song itself. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, like you said, you all had different visions, all had different ideas going into the making of this record, wanted it to be very personal, very intimate. Uh, what was your first reaction to the final mix of these songs when you heard them after all that time? It was like, uh, it was very emotional. Cause I remember thinking while well, COVID and the pandemic was going on, like, I was like, this is surreal. The fact that all this stuff is happening to us and we don't really get like immediate gratification for it either because most people who end up like getting their opportunity in the industry um, they get to jump on a tour immediately or they get to they get to share that opportunity with other people. And for us, because COVID was a thing, we had to wait about like another year and a half to do anything with it. So once I heard those mixes and they first came through, I was just like, oh, my gosh, the opportunities that we could get off of this music and just the the reaction I'm anticipating from it is is next level. I knew that it was going to be a good record, but I didn't know how people we're going to interpret it. It was a lot more um, melodic based, a lot more singer songwriter based. Uh, we essentially took structures from um, pop music to um, hip hop. We we were trying to we were trying to mimic the song structures of music that people were listening to like mindlessly, so that way it's easy to interpret. But we wanted to still give it that hollow front flavor where we're still going to go off when we need to. And knowing that, like, we got those mixes back and we finally get to we get to feel every every little bit of the, the guitar riffs that we're putting in there to the little inflections and Devin's drumming. It was it was incredible. It was really emotional. Yeah, sounds incredible. And uh, you just touched on it a little bit. But, you you know, you said how you want to make a song kind of taking inspiration from other artists, other genres uh what are some of your i guess non-metal or non-rock influences that you were listening to when you made price of dreaming yeah so like um well we were in the studio uh, obviously each of us were listening to different kinds of music but some of the stuff that um i really enjoyed was we'd listen to a, a rapper named nf over here in michigan um a lot of his stuff was though it's like hip-hop and like rap and you could you could kind of find like different different uh, associates of like music that he sounds like he's very he's very artistic and he's very um intellectual in terms of like how he wants to put put his um lyrics or rhythms in the right spot and like his music videos were very creative they always had like themes to them and we were just like okay let's 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 kind of delve off of like different themes let's play around with this stuff so it may not have started with like um the structure of his songs or 
or like how he is as a lyricist, but it'd be like inspiration from like how he's thinking with his music videos to his, uh, his beats, the rhythms, the flows. Um, I'd also listen to Reign of, the Reign of Kindo, which is like a, a proggy funk, like jazzy kind of swingy band. I don't know how to explain them. They were really all over the place. And that gave me the, the inspiration to kind of just like test out different flavors because they'd have songs that'd be more like big band swing focused and then they'd have songs that have a lot more latin vibe more cymbal play and it, it kind of opens up avenues of like okay maybe this this part doesn't need a crazy fill maybe it doesn't need crazy guitars maybe all it needs is just some light cymbals in the background to add it atmosphere and to mix it a little differently to add more depth um i listened to nf reign of kindo um, I love listening to Kendrick Lamar. Uh, I, I love I love funk music too. Anything with like some like offbeat tempos, and you could probably hear a little bit of that stuff in like let's say The Price of Dreaming, where you get that dance beat that like it, it's just little ideas that you find. Um, I also took a lot of inspiration from Disney songs. Um, in in the first song off the album, in the spotlight. Um, very, very hidden. You'll hear a melody going, which is from Frozen 2. And then it's funny because the lyrics also say unknown alone when it's happening, which is a direct reference to it. But it's a different, it's different notes. It's, it's different rhythms. But it's like you could hear the influence if you really pay attention. Yeah, totally. And, you know, so that's something I've noticed about the sound of every hollow front record is, you know, the crazy range of sounds that you explore some songs more clean and melodic got some disney cameos in there other songs totally heavy metalcore stuff i mean where is your mind day to day when you're making a record like this with all these crazy sounds um my brain kind of goes like uh uh when we're making this music as much as we want to be as serious as possible because i feel like hollow fronts all of our babies uh, it's all of our baby. It's we want to take care of it. We want to make sure nothing happens bad to it. Like when you're in a creative process, you need to be a little risky in terms of like what you're willing to what you're willing to play around with. And I feel like the only way you could do that is if you you go in your head and you tell yourself like as much as I want to overthink about these parts, I need to just go with my gut. I need to feel what's what what uh, whatever I'm feeling with this music. And once you start like um, once you start getting entwined with the music and you remember why you play music in the first place, which for me it's it's the the movement, it's the the energy that you you generate when you're listening to it. Like whether you want to dance, whether you want to headbang, whether you want to like sing along to it, it's all that energy. And I feel like as long as you're just feeling it and you you go with what your your heart, your gut feels, you can come up with the best melodies you come up with the best lyrics um with with the song in particular one of the ones that i got to write off the record it was called uh, two worlds away um they told me they're just like all right come to the studio with some ideas um i was listening to a buddy's band called vodlo and they were on dreambound and they they were only instrumental so i was like this music has to be so immersive that you have to be able to interpret it without any words giving you context to what you're listening to and starting off with that premise right off the bat kind of just like opened up like avenues of creativity in my mind. Like I could, I can make this theatrical. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be reflective of every other song that we've written. It could keep the same structure, but you could change the dynamics how you want to. And I felt like as long as you kept your mind open to expansion and just being adventurous, you were going to be able to create whatever you wanted. Yeah, I totally hear all that. I think that's also something really unique about the metalcore genre is how how much different kinds of creativity people can explore. What's special to you about the metalcore genre? I think it's really interesting how like uh, you'll see you'll see certain bands kind of like take off really early, or they'll take off and they'll they'll stay up really high. Uh, the first few that come to mind would be like uh, Bring Me the Horizon, uh, Architects, I Prevail, Wage War. And like when you look at bands like that and you kind of just like try to dissect what makes those bands so unique and what, what kind of like propelled them forward, you could kind of take the fact that each of them are, were very explorative, but 
also tasteful of when they would add different nuances from different genres, ideas, whatever they wanted to. Um, and they, they didn't just, they didn't just be like, all right, we're, we're changing our sound completely. They kind of like hint at it with little bits and pieces with the singles or like the songs that they put in the album. And then one album, I feel like that's how you get the contrast between one album to the next is, okay, they played around with this idea in this album. And then the next one, they really jumped into it and then added a, a new touch to it. That, that's kind of like foreshadowing for the future. That's kind of continuous growth. And metalcore, I feel like, isn't so much the 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 music that you're playing it's like the style of how you're interpreting the music you're playing because I, I you listen to wage war and you get low they'd be like okay i could hear architects in this intro but then you listen to the chorus and it almost sounds like a like a country pop song um and i don't think there's a lot of genres out there that kind of can touch base on those differences in in music because you get like a really tough riff, a really mean riff, and then you get this really full, open, kind of like soaring chorus. And the, the ability to kind of delve into different aspects like that's really exciting. Yeah, totally, totally. And um, kind of switching gears for a moment, I, I noticed on your, your Instagram, you started uh, posting videos of you singing and playing guitar, doing these you know, crazy vocal harmonies and stuff. What's, uh, what's your musical background? Yeah, so I went to um, an, a, a, like an arts academy growing up. Um, I was in public school for like a, maybe a few years. And then right around third grade, I ended up going to a place called West Michigan Academy for uh, arts and academics. So over here in uh, the, the, the West Michigan area. And there it kind of like opened my eyes to just that arts can be taken very seriously and from there they they had like a festival of the arts that they'd play every week every year and be a whole week devoted just to arts and there have been a few circumstances where i'd see either like uh rock bands coming in or uh jazz artists coming in and then in the high school i'd be able to uh, play with the jazz band and we go to different competitions and get to witness different kinds of like performers and eventually um, led me to auditioning for Berklee College of Music. Uh, I ended up getting accepted. It was a whole process, but I wasn't able to afford the bill right up flat, which I don't understand how a lot of people can afford that. But it's one of the most prestigious music schools in the world. So the people that do get to go, they get a lot out of it. And when I did get to take that journey going to that school, um, it, it, all, it was very humbling. Because you, you get to see all these people who are basically considered great and prodigies in their, own, um, in their own worlds. But you put us all together and you get to see each other for each other. And you're just like, wow, I'm, I really don't, don't got it as good as I thought I did. And um, it, it humbled me to a point where I could kind of like, I guess, soak up everybody else's influences the reasons why they why they got into music and what drove me was it took me to different states it took me to different places it took me to new people and being a being an artsy kid that was really overweight growing up uh i didn't i didn't feel like i could connect with people too easily so whenever i got to meet other people that enjoyed music as much as i did it kind of like just was the the gateway to making really long-term friends yeah, definitely. And, you know, you just mentioned how performing and uh, playing with other musicians, a big part of your musical background. You are going on tour this summer in support of August Burns Red, along with We Came as Romans and Void of Vision. You are coming to Starland Ballroom in Sarahville, New Jersey. Yeah. WSOU is going to be hanging out there. Uh, that's July 16th. Uh, what are you most excited about going on tour, getting back on the road, share this experience with your fans? Oh, man, I'm so stoked to be able to just like... Uh be able to see people that we've just recently met. Um, Hollow Fronts maybe had like a few, there like a handful of moments uh, in our careers that like feel very, very like propelled, feel very like out in the mainstream music community. And um, most of them have been fairly recent with uh, the We Came As Romans tour that we took uh, uh, last year up into the Fit For A King tour this year. Um, so being able to go back out on the road with people that we've looked up to 
also just being a part of this uh, amazing community after like we went through a traumatic event of a, a car accident that happened this last tour it'll be nice to reconnect with people that we had just recently met whether that be on the fit for a king tour or the we came as romans tour so it's even that much more integrated because it feels like nostalgia right from a year ago um but it'll also be nice having our merch guy back after the fact too because on the fit for a king tour he ended up getting a an injury on his collarbone he basically separated the bones that were in his collarbone from everything else um but he he ended up getting reconstructive surgery and they basically told him that he should be able to go out on the road with us again so i'm excited for him to see what what the people think about him or like what the people want to say to him after the fact because everywhere that we've been since have always been like how's davian how's your merch guy how's he how's he doing i'm just like Dude, the fact that all these people know you without us even mentioning the story just tells how entwined it is. Yeah, totally. And, you know, you just mentioned how you've already done a tour with We Came as Romans. You did a tour with Fit for a King. You're meeting all these people. You're getting airplay. You know, what, what has it been like uh, to see Hollow Front grow so much over the past few years? Incredible. I, I feel like being able to be there from the beginning because i was in a different band at the time but hollow front opened up for that band and we were playing in a, a local uh dive bar and there was maybe like i think 40 people at that show and we thought that was one of the craziest shows of our life to the point where like we play like the palladium with polaris alpha wolf like Moss of flames and banana mint like it being able to collide the tours being able to meet all these people see the growth has been like I don't know. It, it's kind of scary at the same time, um, but really, really incredible and just makes makes me feel like it, it it brings to realism the fact that if you want something bad enough and you're willing to work towards it and may, basically push every decision in that direction, you will get there. And it, it makes me so happy knowing that like people are excited to support us because they've seen that journey too and they've been a part of it. And it also gives us an opportunity to write what maybe past generations of bands didn't have right. And that's the fans are the reason you're here. And you need to be able to connect and be willing to connect with those fans at, on many different platforms. And nowadays with TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all this stuff being like a lot of integration into a music community, I feel like we got the best possible case scenario to succeed of course of course so um up next i have a few questions that are a little random but they're some of our favorite questions to ask bands that we interview so first <laughs> one is uh if the band weren't called hollow front what would you be called man so if if the band wasn't called hollow front I feel like there were, there were a few other options on the table because Frankie was the one who came up. Frankie Mish, he was in Sleep Waker. He was the one that came up with uh, the name Hollow Front and came up with like designs and stuff. But I feel like if I had a decision for what the band would be called, it'd be, it'd be something really meme worthy, similar to like I Set My Friends on Fire or The Devil Wears Prada, just because like that's, that's my taste in band names. Uh, I, I miss the old long band names. I miss the old scene core t-shirts. Um, but they probably want to lean more towards something that's like you search on Google and you're the only name that pops up. So you got to come up with some weird combination names. Maybe like let's let's do a snuggle LaCroix. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just find like we'll find inspiration from weird stuff. <laughs> All right. Snuggle LaCroix. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, next one is, if you could pick one Hollow Front song to send out to aliens for them to listen to, and they would hear it, which song would it be? Ooh, that one's a tough one. Because I like the heavy, but I like the pretty. Let's, let's, let's go, like, somewhere dead center in the middle. Let's give, them, let's give them either Treading Water or let's give them Loose Threads. Got it. One yeah, because you, you get the clean, you get the heavy, you get the crazy, you, you get to have all of it. Best of both worlds. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, lastly, what's next for Hollow Front? 
So we are playing Blue Ridge Fest right after we get off of the August Burns Red Tour. Um, we're playing, I believe, that Saturday at Blue Ridge. Um, and then after that, we are coming back home and we are basically going to be connecting with each other and discussing and working on new material. Um, we obviously don't want to say that we're working on the full album right off the bat because uh, we just released an album and and we have no intention of like uh, moving too fast, but we also don't want to, we don't want to stay stagnant in ideas and like let ourselves not delve into it a little bit. And I feel like right after that tour, we're going to have a lot of inspiration of stuff that we're going to be able to talk about. So we're going to be, we're going to be reconnecting with each other over at Lee's house, probably talking over some new music, figuring some stuff out. And hopefully by sometime next year, early next year, you might be able to see us uh, trying to come back out on a European run. Um, don't have a lot of details on that right now, but it, it does look like next year will be our reconnection back with uh, European dates. Uh, this year we had them canceled in February. We were supposed to be out with ERA, Brand Sacrifice, and Dayseeker, um, but we ended up having to cancel that due to COVID restrictions. But I'm hoping that sometime next year, or even sooner if we can, no, no promises, but you'll see us out in the European side of things. Fantastic. So Dakota, thank you so much for doing this. Hollow Front, Price of Dreaming out now. Go check it out. You can hear it on WSOU. Dakota, anything else you want to add? Um, if you guys have any requests or anything that you, you enjoy about us, anything that you'd like to see from uh, us live or in the studio, by all means, connect with us on our Instagram. We also react on our Twitter. Um, we love seeing your guys' YouTube reactions. We really appreciate you guys putting the your, your own take on the music. Um, and if you guys have the opportunity, go check out our uh, merch, tallowfrontmerch.com. We'll be posting periodically through each month, getting like little weekend sales. And you'll see some cool stuff coming up here soon as we get closer to the tour and after the tour. All right, fantastic. This is Patrick, WSOU 89.5, Dakota. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you guys.